on a mission to explore Naples, the site of one of the world's most remarkable purported reoccurring miracles, the liquefaction of the blood of third century bishop and martyr, Saint Januarius. Dating back centuries, this phenomena is said to continue to reoccur three times each year in the presence of the Archbishop of Naples. When this inexplicable event does not occur, it is a portent of possible misfortune befalling the city in the form of earthquakes and plague. Miracle, marvel, or hoax? Travel with me as we investigate one of Catholicism's most mysterious phenomena. My name is Michael O'Neill. I'm the Miracle Hunter. I research and investigate the supernatural, traveling the world to take a deeper look at how miraculous events have had a transformative effect on world history, inspiring some of Catholicism's most famous devotions and most magnificent churches. From miraculous images of the Virgin Mary and the inexplicably incorruptible bodies of great saints, to the miracles of the Eucharist and those who bear the wounds of Christ, Journey with me around the globe to see the wonders that have inspired the fascination and faith of believers for centuries. We fly into Rome, but we must travel on the ground 150 miles to the city of Naples in the southwest Italian region of Campania. We'll soon see that this southern Italian city of Naples is a unique place on so many levels. Its name comes from the Greek, Nea, meaning new, and polis, city. And it's one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the entire world. Nearby, there are many sites recognized the world over. The Amalfi Coast, Capri, the Palace of Caserta, the Roman ruins of Pompeii and Herculaneum are all an easy day trip away. Even a hike up nearby Mount Vesuvius is a possibility. Naples experienced its golden age in the 18th century. As the capital of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, it was considered one of Europe's most regal cities. The royal palace in nearby Caserta was built as the main residence for the king of Naples. It was the largest royal palace in Europe, overshadowing those of Versailles, Buckingham Palace, Vienna, Prague, and Madrid. During the period of the monarchy, the theater and opera houses flourished in Naples. The Royal Theater of San Carlo opened in 1737, and to this day is the oldest continuously active venue for opera in the world. In the 17th century, puppetry became an important part of the Commedia dell'arte, an early form of professional theater. Over the centuries, one character, Pulcinella, entered into the collective imagination of Neapolitan culture, and his image is everywhere in the streets of Naples today. Neapolitans are still known for dramatic personalities and inclination for music. In fact, the romantic guitar and mandolin were both invented in this ancient city. Some of the country's most well-known actors, comedians, and musicians like Pino Daniele are Neapolitans. Walking the city streets, it's easy to see that another source of pride for Neapolitans is their soccer club, Napoli, and their late soccer legend, Diego Maradona. And it almost goes without saying that Naples' greatest claim to fame is in the culinary world. Naples with the bragging rights on the invention of the pizza. To be considered authentic, it should be made with mozzarella cheese of nearby buffalo milk and tomatoes grown in the volcanic soil of Mount Vesuvius. The history of the world-renowned comfort food dates to the 19th century when Queen Margarita of Savoy visited Naples. As she paraded through the streets, a local baker offered her the city's trademark dish in the colors of the new Italian tricolor flag. White mozzarella cheese for the country's snow-capped mountains, red tomatoes for blood spilled during unification, and green basil for its verdant hills and landscape. The classic cheese pizza, the margarita, 
takes its name from the queen. On our way to the Duomo is Via San Gregorio Armeno. This street showcases the renowned Presepe, or nativity scene, which has a long and storied tradition in Naples. The word Presepe means crib, and it traces its origins to St. Francis of Assisi, who recreated the birth of Jesus visually for the first time in 1223. He celebrated the Christmas Mass with a manger, an ox, and a donkey, and pastors to reenact in Italy the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. Soon, the tradition of reenacting the Nativity of Christ spread throughout the Italian peninsula. The live nativity scene was followed by the creation of smaller handcrafted nativity scenes with figurines and models. Starting in the early 1300s and over the following decades and centuries, Neapolitan artists began sculpting elaborate life-size figures of the Holy Family in churches both in and outside Naples. They became masters of the nativity scenes working with wood, terracotta, and stone. Many churches were commissioned and embellished by Naples' most noble families during this period. Though some are in disrepair, many have been renovated. In a city that has no less than 52 patron saints, Neapolitans have a heart for their saints. A short walk from Via San Gregorio Armeno is the Church of San Domenico Maggiore. Built over the remains of a smaller church from the 10th century, the current church was completed in 1324 by Charles I of Anjou and given to the charge of the Dominicans. The church boasts the tombs of notable personages as well as numerous works of art. The complex was once part of the University of Naples and St. Thomas Aquinas taught here for a time. Inside the friary is the room where the saint lived while here. Not far is the complex of Santa Chiara, the largest and one of the most impressive churches in Naples. Founded in 1310 by the Anjou dynasty, the Franciscan complex boasts the Church of Santa Chiara, a beautiful cloister and convent, tombs, and an archeological museum. Near Santa Chiara is another storied church, Gesù Nuovo. Originally a palace built in 1470 for the Prince of Salerno, it passed to the Jesuits the following century. It is beautifully embellished and endowed with numerous chapels and tombs of personages from centuries past. Along the right side of the nave is the tomb of a contemporary saint, Saint Giuseppe Moscati. He was a physician from the early 20th century who blended faith and science in his practice. Having taken vows of consecration, he served the poor free of charge and frequently prescribed the sacraments as well as medicine. In the rear of the church, items from his study and home were relocated and reconstructed as they were when he lived in them. His house, located in Via Cisterna de Olio, is a short walk from the church. Outside the vicinity of the Duomo, nearby Spacanopoli, meaning the street that splits Naples, is the perfect place to take in the heart of historic Naples. Whether it's the Vespas buzzing up and down the streets, loud discussions in the Neapolitan dialect, children kicking soccer balls, or the aromas of bakeries and eateries, there is no shortage of stimuli here. With a population of almost a million people in the city proper, and over three million in its metropolitan area, it is the third most populous city in Italy, after Rome and Milan. While Naples is notorious for urban plight, and has a reputation for being Italy's most chaotic city, Neapolitans don't seem to mind. Whether it's the frenzied roads, graffiti-covered buildings, clever pickpockets, or overcrowded apartment buildings, the locals appear to revel in it. The fact is that Neapolitans have ample positive reasons to take pride in their city. Its list of accomplishments are impressive. It's even been recognized by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. Just off Spacanopoli is Naples Underground. A visit to the tunnels beneath the city provides an interesting and educational experience of the history of Naples. Some 40 meters below the bustling streets in the heart of Naples is a series of passageways. Originally used as a quarry by ancient Greeks to build the city's first edifices, 
the tunnels were used in later epochs for purposes as diverse as cisterns and bomb shelters. Naples' religious traditions and devotions are legendary. The most important saint in Naples is undoubtedly St. Januarius, San Gennaro in Italian. In and around Naples, devotion to the city's patron saint is fierce. The saint, as well as the treasure of San Gennaro, has found its way into countless films, plays, and lore. The relics of St. Januarius are conserved in the city's most important church, the cathedral, known in Italian as the Duomo. Originally built in the fourth century as an ancient Christian basilica over a pagan Greek temple dedicated to Apollo, the present church is in the French Gothic style from the high Middle Ages. Only the baptistery from the fifth century has been preserved. Upon entering the church, we can see that it is filled with notable artwork and has an impressive nave, funerary tombs, and numerous side chapels. The most important part of the Duomo, aside from the tabernacle, of course, is the Chapel of the Treasury, Cappella del Tosoro in Italian. Over the centuries, priceless gifts of precious metals and stones were made by royals, noblemen, and countless others to give thanks for a grace received through the intercession of St. Januarius. Yet for Neapolitans, the true treasury consists of the blood and relics of the saint himself. A silver reliquary bust containing the skull of St. Januarius is contained within a tabernacle, while his blood is preserved in two ampules within a type of bank vault. The keys to the vault are held by a commission of local notables, including the mayor of Naples. The name St. Januarius traces its roots to Janus, the two-faced Roman god of doorways and beginnings. The first month of the year, January, takes its name from the same Latin root, as it represents the month in which one looks backwards and forwards. It is likely St. Januarius was born in January. Legends about St. Januarius abound. It is believed that he was born in Naples in the second half of the third century and was elected bishop of nearby Benevento. There he served the Christian community with charity and courage. He was not only beloved by the Christian faithful, but was also respected by the pagans. According to the most ancient passion of St. Januarius, Januarius was in prison in Pozzioli under the orders of Emperor Diocletian in the year 305. He had gone there to visit his friend, a deacon named Socio, who had been imprisoned for the Christian faith. Januarius was tortured, though the punishments had no effect. Therefore, he was thrown into a fiery furnace. When the furnace was reopened, Januarius came out unharmed without being the least bit affected by the fire. Instead, according to the legend, the pagans who came to witness the execution were burned. He was then sentenced to be torn to pieces by wild beasts in the amphitheater. However, here too, the animals acted like gentle lambs. During this time, the judge who sentenced him to Matteo fell ill. Despite the fact that he was healed by Januarius, Timoteo showed no gratitude. Instead, he had the saint sentenced to decapitation. On the way to his execution, a beggar asked Januarius for a piece of his mantle to be kept as a relic. Januarius replied that once the sentence was carried out, he could take the handkerchief with which he was to be blindfolded. Tradition has it that while the executioner was preparing to deliver the fatal blow, Gennaro put a finger to his throat to fix his handkerchief. At that very moment, the executioner lowered the axe, cutting off his finger as well as his head. The date was September 19th, 305. Also, according to tradition, a pious woman named Eusebia gathered the blood immediately after the beheading, as was the custom at that time. 
She enclosed it in two ampules or vials. Between the years 413 and 431, the Bishop of Naples, Giovanni I, transported the relics of the saint from Agro Marciano to the lower part of the Neapolitan catacombs of Capo di Monte. During the transfer of his remains to Naples, Eusebia gave the bishop two vials containing the martyr's blood. Devotion to St. Januarius spread quickly. Later that century, the underground cemetery where he was buried was adorned with frescoes, inscriptions, mosaics, and paintings. The tomb soon became an important pilgrimage destination. In fact, there is archaeological evidence to confirm this. In the last century, an archaeologist named Umberto Fasola discovered the original burial place of St. Januarius with precious mosaics. Already by the middle of the 5th century, Januarius was considered a saint according to the ancient custom of popular acclaim. His sainthood was confirmed in 1586 by Pope Sixtus V. Neapolitans began seeking his intercession during periods of calamity. In 472, Mount Vesuvius erupted and the people flocked to the catacombs pleading for his intercession. This is the first documented episode of the populace invoking him during earthquakes, eruptions, or other natural calamities. In this same year, San Gennaro assumed the title of main patron of the city. During another eruption in the year 512, the Bishop of Naples, Stefano I, began the propitiatory prayers. Afterwards, he had a church built in St. Januarius's honor, next to the first cathedral. In later centuries, the relics of St. Januarius became the object of strife. In 831 AD, the Lombard Prince of Benevento, Sicone I, invaded the city of Naples. He took the opportunity to bring the remains of the saint back to his birthplace of Benevento. The holy relics were placed in the cathedral where they remained until the year 1154. In that year, since the city of Benevento was no longer safe, the Norman William I arranged for them to be moved to the Abbey of Monte Vergine. In Monte Vergine, however, devotion to St. Januarius decreased as the pilgrims who went there were devoted to other saints. In Naples, on the other hand, the cult of St. Januarius was very alive, also due to the presence of his other relics, the head and the ampules with his blood. During this time, the court of Anjou, including Charles II and his son, Robert of Anjou, commissioned French goldsmiths to construct a precious bust reliquary in gilded silver to contain the head and the ampules with the blood of the saint. It was shown to the public for the first time in the year 1305. In 1497, the bones of San Gennaro were rediscovered under the main abbey of the altar of Monte Vergine. With the assistance of Cardinal Giovanni of Aragon and the powerful Carafa family, the relics were translated from Monte Vergine to Naples. Cardinal Oliviero Carafa had an exceptional crypt built in the Renaissance style, built as a worthy place to conserve them in the Cathedral of Naples, below the main altar, the Socorpo Chapel. In 1964, a professor named Gastone Lambertini and Professor Baima Bologna identified an ancient skeletal material belonging to a man between 30 and 35 years old, about 5 feet 5 inches tall. The coagulated blood of St. Januarius is stored in two hermetically sealed small ampules, or vials, held in a silver reliquary. The smaller, cylindrically shaped one contains a few reddish spots, while the larger one is more than half filled with the dark red blood. According to an ancient document, something extraordinary was recorded on August 17, 1389. The coagulated blood in the vials melted. Though it may have happened previously, this is the first time it was documented. At present, the two ampules mysteriously liquefy three times a year. The first takes place on the first Saturday of May, 
which recalls the translation of his bones from Pozzioli to Capodimonte. The procession takes place consisting of the bust of the saint and the theca, with the ampules of the blood and silver statues of other patron saints of the city, from the Duomo to the Church of Santa Chiara. The archbishop holds the reliquary up and tilts it side to side to show that the contents are solid. Then he places it on the high altar next to the saint's other relics. After ritual prayers by the faithful, the coagulated blood in the larger vial begins to liquefy. The archbishop then holds up the vial and tilts it again to demonstrate the liquefaction. The relics are exposed there for eight days. The most important day takes place on September 19th, the saint's feast day and anniversary of his martyrdom when he was decapitated in Pozzioli in the year 305. After the mass presided by the Archbishop of Naples, the bishop holds up the vial, once again moving it side to side. A third liquefaction takes place on December 16th, the feast of the patronage of San Gennaro. It recalls a disastrous eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 1631. The lava stopped before the relics of the saint. The relics are exposed for that very day. There seems to be a bit of variability in the exact manner of the liquefaction. Usually it takes place immediately, although it can take hours or even days. According to records in the cathedral archives, on other occasions, the liquefaction already took place before the ampules were taken from the safe. On rare occasions, however, the contents fail to liquefy. It is said that when this happens, a calamity such as a war, famine, disease, or other such disaster will take place in or around Naples. In the last century, the miracle failed to happen in 1939 and 1940, coinciding with the beginning of World War II in Italy's entry into it. It happened again in September 1943 when the Nazis occupied Italy. More recently, the blood failed to liquefy on September 19, 1980. Just over one month later, on November 23rd, a devastating earthquake registering 6.9 on the Richter scale took place in the nearby city of Irpinia. It left at least 2,483 people dead, at least 7,700 injured, and over 250,000 homeless. The most recent failure took place during the COVID-19 pandemic. On December 16th, 2020, the blood remained solid after having liquefied in May and September of the same year. In modern times, there have been numerous scientific investigations to either confirm or refute the phenomena of the dissolution of blood. The scientific inquiries have focused on two aspects, an analysis of the substance in the ampules and the study and reproduction of the procedures with which these are handled during the ceremony. As the church has never allowed the ampules to be opened, it is not possible for science to offer a definitive conclusion. Without a clear negative opinion on behalf of the scientific community, the ecclesiastical authorities have allowed popular veneration of the blood of San Gennaro. At the same time, the church has never officially recognized the phenomena as miraculous, though they have in many ways encouraged devotion to the miracle. And with that, we must say goodbye to Naples with all the fanfare and devotion to its miracle working patron saint, Saint Januarius. We may never know what to make of this purported supernatural phenomena, but the memory of the sights, sounds, smells, and most importantly, faith of this ancient city brimming with life will be with us forever.